Today we're going to discuss field device simulators, analog and digital. I have videos out there now on how to build one of these, a digital field device simulator. It has six inputs and six outputs. In other words, it has uh, six sets of switches for inputs and six uh, LEDs for outputs. So we already have videos on how to build this very simple circuit. And today we're going to talk about uh, building one of these. This is an analog field device simulator. And um, we'll go right to some of the images and discuss what you can do. Both of these are kits that you could buy. I used to sell these fully assembled. Most of the time I built them myself. Um, and then there was a period where I had them built by a professional assembler out in Iowa. And I don't sell a whole lot of them, but I do like to make them available for people who don't want to just buy some lights and switches and throw together something. They want it to look a little bit more tidy. Not necessary. Anything I show you, you're welcome to copy. As a matter of fact, if you want to build these things and sell them assembled, you're more than welcome to. Let's jump in and look at some of the circuits. This is the kit for the analog field device simulator. The only unique component here is the box. These are boxes that I have professionally machined and printed so they have a real nice appearance. And then of course you need a 24 volt DC power adapter. And notice that I have the power adapter and the bulkhead connectors in blue. That's because the plug on that power adapter has to match the two bulkhead connectors. You just need to make sure that if you're going to buy your own hardware that your power adapter plug matches your bulkhead connectors or you just wire it direct. Anyway, this all comes in the kit so in the kit you don't have to worry about it. One thing not shown in the kit are the solder lugs and I supply at least 14 of those and you'll see those as we assemble the unit. We need six sets of binding posts and then you need two zero to ten volt DC displays. Now the displays are only going to display 0 to 10 volts. They're not 4 to 20 milliamp. We also need a 24 volt DC indicator. You can see it laying down there between the potentiometers and the displays. It's just a 24 volt pilot light. Any will do. You need two bulkhead connectors and there's a reason for two and I'll explain it at some point. You need, you need two 10k linear potentiometers and you need five single pole double throw mini toggle switches and of course two knobs for your potentiometer. So let, let's look at the circuit. Okay now this is kind of a crude drawing but you see the binding post and if you look at the bottom set you'll see that the bottom terminal on those four is all connected together with a black conductor and then that black conductor also goes out to the bucking voltage circuit to both of the uh, zero or negative uh, connections on that little circuit board that says out 10 volt DC, 24 volts DC in. And we also have the, if you want to call it the common bus, goes to the, the outside connections on both bulkhead connectors and then it runs up to the two potentiometers. The two potentiometers, the terminals are facing each other so you have to be very careful which of the three solder lugs you attach the black wire to, the negative or the zero, the common. It needs to be on the bottom lug on the one on the right and the top lug on the one on the left. You can see that. And then it goes up to the negative terminal on one of those binding posts up underneath the displays. Now these displays can be three wire or four wire. If you got four wires, that's what you see here. Each display has two connectors, one for power and one for the voltage you're going to measure. Some of them only have three wires and that's because they share the common wire or the, the zero volt DC conductor. They both work the same. So here you see all of the negative side of the devices connected all together into one common connection. So that's uh, the common connections from the two displays, from the two uh, binding posts underneath the, the displays, one, on, one to each potentiometer, and then you've got the pilot light right there in the middle it's got a negative wire or a zero volt DC wire and then you've also got the four binding posts on the bottom and the two bulkhead connectors and then you have the two common or zero minus 
connections on that bucking voltage circuit over to the right. Okay, that's the DC common. Then here's the DC plus, the 24 volts DC. Now this is not all common. They're all red conductors, but I want you to notice something. Start with the bulkhead connectors down on the bottom. You see there's two of them. And the reason that there's two of them, that way you can jumper two or more of these field device simulators together and only need one external power supply. So they can share one power supply. So follow the red wires from those two bulkhead connectors down on the bottom up to the on-off toggle switch. So the unswitched power goes to the middle lug on that toggle switch. And then when you flip the switch up, it it connects the middle lug with the bottom lug, and then that goes a whole bunch of places. First, it goes over to the bucking voltage circuit card where it says 24 volts DC in. Then you see it goes up to the positive tab or the positive solder lug on the pilot light. Then it goes up and splits off and supplies power to both of the displays because both of those displays, digital displays, need a constant input voltage to power them. You've also got a completely separate red circuit, DC circuit. It's the 10 volts out from that bucking voltage circuit card, and it goes to the, I call it the top end of the potentiometers. Now you notice that when we were doing the negative, that the common or the negative went to one end of the potentiometers, and here the 10 volts goes to the other end of the potentiometers. You gotta make sure you wire it up this way Otherwise, you go rotating your knob when you're looking at the front, and when you turn it up, the voltage goes down. When you turn it down, the voltage goes up. You don't want it going backwards, and you don't want it showing up as a negative value instead of a positive. So there's three circuits here, from the power connectors on the bottom up to the on-off switch. That's one. Then from the on-off switch, you've got a circuit that goes to the circuit board over there and then goes up to the binding post. Well, it goes up to... The two displays, not to the binding post, not the binding post. Then the third circuit comes out of the 10 volt circuit card and goes over to the two potentiometers. Now this is your output connections to the PLC. Now what I don't show here is a a zero or common leaving here and going to the PLC. You will need one. So that's one conductor that's missing here. So you need a black conductor leaving this device and going up to the PLC along with these conductors. So you've got a variety of things going on here. The thing I want you to notice is that the binding post on the outside, the vertical ones that have a blue and a purple wire, notice that the blue wire goes to the top of the switch, top solder lug, and then the bottom solder lug goes up to the potentiometer in the center blue wire goes off to the PLC. The purple over on the left has the exact same circuit, but notice the two in the middle are different. They have one conductor going from the binding post up to the center lug, and then depending on the position of the switch, it connects the center, lay, the, the center lug of that switch, the orange wire that comes from the binding post, it flips it either to the white wire or the orange wire. This is to facilitate choosing between 0 to 10 volts and 4 to 20 milliamps or 0 to 20 milliamps from those two center sets of binding posts. So the only analog signal that this device will supply for you is the two potentiometers and they will be fed to the purple and the blue. So they can you can take uh, 0 to 10 volts external, come to the binding post, and depending on the position of the switch, you can select between 0 to 10 on the binding post and 0 and 10 to the potentiometer. The two displays give you two analog output simulators, 0 to 10 volts. There is no 4 to 20 out uh, facilitated with this device. And then this is your unique separate DC, so you adjust that circuit board down there to put out like just a little over 10 volts DC. If you don't adjust it, you'll get 18 volts across the potentiometers and you'll have too high a voltage on your analog inputs. So this is the connection for the bucking circuit. Okay, this is 
what it looks like with the components installed. The only thing that's not installed here are the displays, but you can see the six sets of binding posts, the green indicator, the on and off switch, that turns off power on and off for the whole box. And then you've got four toggle switches. The first one picks between the output from the potentiometer above it and the binding post below it. It picks one of those two to go to an analog input on your PLC. On the far right, you have the exact same arrangement. That toggle switch picks between what's on the binding post, 0 to 10 volts, and the potentiometer, 0 to 10 volts. The middle two toggle switches and binding posts, those binding posts, the red connection goes through the toggle switches to your analog inputs. This allows you to wire up both voltage and current inputs and then facilitate that from these two center sets of binding posts. So there's no 4 to 20 signal supplied by this device. Okay, and when you attach, you know, you connect all of your devices here. You don't connect them, I mean install them. There's nuts on the back or on the front. Uh, snug them down. Don't over tighten them. I've over tightened those nuts on the toggle switches and actually snapped off the whole top of the toggle switch. So be careful. Just run them down snug. They come with lock washers, so they don't have to be super tight. The potentiometers have a little anti-rotation nub or pin sticking off of the base of it. Just take your needle nose and snap that right off. It's just potted metal. Uh, you, there's no way you can break anything or hurt anything. Just snap those off. You don't need those. You're going to tighten them down so they don't rotate. The ins When you insert the displays, make sure you insert them with the decimal point at the bottom. <laughs> you don't... You don't want your numbers reading upside down. So you're going to have to look at them close if you hold them under a light. Uh, or you can just uh, connect 24 volts to them and see the decimal point for yourself. As I mentioned before, there are four wire and three wire displays. The difference is with four wire, there's two commons and they are common. It's just one connection, but they've got two connectors. So those two black wires are going to get uh, connected to the same point and then the other one right next to it is a three wire it's only got one black wire so black and red are power yellow is the signal you're going to measure the voltage level you're going to measure with the display and then you'll see that one of the red wires on the four wire it also is for the display so the one on the left one red wire is for power the other is to connect to what, wherever the voltage is coming from that you want to display. Now the orientation of the solder tabs, terminals and the potentiometers, is extremely important. I don't have them perfectly laid out, but the general location. So you kind of have to hold those solder tabs in, the, in those locations and then tighten the nuts on the back of the binding post terminals. Notice that the two potentiometers are rotated in a position that kind of aim the terminals into the most open area the back of that front of the enclosure. Then up top side uh, you've got solder lugs on each of the four binding post terminals. The one that I have circled in orange I try to send 14 of these lugs with each kit. So you might want to put two up there because you're going to find you got a lot of black wires to connect to that one spot up there. Now down on the bottom, you see an orange circle. Uh, one of those tabs is going to be for the common bus connection through this whole, in, you know, box, and the other one is going to carry the common over to the bottom side of the enclosure. The um, light, the indicator, the on-off light right above the on-off switch. That hole, it's a machine for the minimum size for one of those indicators. Most of them are slightly larger. So you're going to have to take something and enlarge that hole before you can slide in your indicator. I would advise you to be very carefully how aggressive you get making that hole bigger. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a washer and you're not going to be happy with it. So the thing to do is to take the, the drill bit that just barely fits down in that hole 
and go to the next larger size and try that and then try to slide the pilot light into the hole. Um, I use one of those unibits that has multiple sizes on it and you just keep pushing it in until you get the size of the hole you want. If you don't have one of those, just make sure you have a good drill index that it's got a lot of uh, increments between different sizes so you don't oversize the hole. Solder generous lengths of red and black wire to the indicator before you install it. I say generous, meaning seven, eight inches or so. It, it's better to waste a little wire when you assemble this than for the wires to be too short. Because remember, these wires have to reach to certain locations in the box. Okay, so here we've got a couple more pictures uh, for you to look at. And remember, this you can use this to assemble your kit or to build your own. So I'm just showing you a couple more views. You can refer back to this later. And now I'm connecting up the black wire. Notice that um, I cut, you know, lengths of wire and then I just set them, kind of spring-loaded in a sense, and they hold themselves in the openings of the solder lugs. That's why I say if you're real clever, you could just lay the stripped ends into the solder lugs and solder. By the way, one of these has two conductors in it. At this point, that's the only one you would be soldering because both of the other ones need two wires in there and if you solder it in now and fill that hole in with solder you're gonna have trouble getting another wire in there now you can see that I have two of the connections soldered I'm noticing that I didn't fill in the complete solder lug opening like I did on the other one if you look at the other one it's completely filled in I prefer them completely filled in and fully wetted into all the conductors. That's a solid connection there inside the orange circle. Okay, now I'm continuing the black wire up into other components. So I add a second wire in that negative terminal on that binding post. Then I go ahead and solder it. And then I run the wire up to the top terminal on the potentiometer. And then put another wire from there up to the terminal on the negative side of the binding post up under the display. You, know, you can follow your eyes up there right here. So I'm going from here up to the potentiometer and then to here. I'm also taking all of the black conductors from these two displays. Now notice I've got the negative conductor from the pilot light going to here and I've got these two black wires from this display I don't have that one in there yet, but I, I can either put this black wire over here into this one, or I could crowd this connection over here. That's why I was suggesting you might put two solder tabs here, because right now we've got four, we've got one, two, three, four wires setting in here, yet to be soldered, and that can be cumbersome. This is just another view over here uh, that you can see where these wires are coming from. So we're completing, if you want to call it the zero volt DC bus of this device. And here you see it's completed and we have the, we've run a, a wire from here up to this potentiometer. Make sure you put the black or negative at the top here and the bottom over here and then up to here. And then we include the black or zero volt wire from this display. That completes the negative bus. Okay, now we need to solder up the bulkhead connectors. Now you may not use these. You may wire direct or use a terminal block. But what I do is I take a plug and I plug it into the connector. That way if I accidentally put too much heat on that center terminal, it won't displace the pin inside the connector. So the plug will hold everything in place. Then once it's cool, I can pull the plug out. So what I do is I take a red wire long enough to, you know, like six inches, strip one in. I dip the stranded stripped ends into solder paste, flux. And then it's sticky, and then I lay it in the, um, if you want to call it the well, the solder well on the middle pin. And the sticky kind of holds it there. And then I solder it. You see over here it's soldered. And I make sure that the solder, I see it sucked into this hole. 
that tells me that everything was hot enough to melt the solder and I got a good connection. Here I take and lay in the negative wire into this solder lug and then over here you can see I've soldered it. I filled up the hole completely. I've trimmed off the excess and I've bent the wire back a little bit to make it easy to install. Then I put a piece of shrink tubing on the middle wire. It could be on either one. Uh, the chances of them shorting are almost zero but just by habit I tend to shrink uh, tube something on the center connection so there's no way over the over time that this can get bent over into here and short out. Then I install both of these into the bottom half of the box. Now yes these are a little too close together to make it easy to use a wrench to tighten the nuts. So you're going to have to use a needle nose plier. It's a little cumbersome. I apologize for that. I should have put it a little further over. My struggle here were those two ribs in the middle of the box and then the curvature on the other side of the two connectors. And I wanted them right next to each other. So you can see that I have both of these installed. They each have their own red and black wires and they're ready to be connected into the circuit. Okay, another device is a bucking voltage converter. So with this, you can put in a voltage, zero to something, and then you can adjust the output zero to something. In this case, we're using 24 volts DC for our power. So that's what I connect to the input, and it's marked N minus N plus. Then you've also got out minus out plus. You put 24 volts on it, or whatever your power is, and then you adjust that little potentiometer for just a little over 10 volts out. I usually make it 10.2. Take a piece of double-sided sticky tape, then peel off the other half, and then stick it to the bottom of your enclosure. The black and the red wires, the ones you see in front of you, say out minus, out plus, and you can see the other end, you see in plus. You've got to pay strict attention to what you're doing here. Okay, next... Next, I have you, or I, connect these four wires. Now, you got to be really careful what you're doing here. Now, the colors don't matter, okay? I tend to use these colors because you can buy a cable, you know, a PVC sheath cable with these exact colors in it. But these four conductors right here are really critical. Notice starting on the left, you're going from the positive binding post to the top solder lug on that toggle switch. And the same thing on the far right with the blue wire. You're going to the top lug on the switch. But the two middle ones, because remember that you are switching, the two outside ones switch between the potentiometer and the binding post. But the two middle ones are switching between the binding post. They're switching the binding post to two possible connections on the analog input module. One for current, one for voltage. And I do these wires first because they're the most difficult to handle and manipulate with your fingers. And if you had a whole bunch of other wires in there already, it would be bad news. Okay, so then I add the 10 volt DC conductor for the two potentiometers. And notice that wire just goes off to the right and it'll go to that circuit board in the, the bottom half of the enclosure. Notice that I did overheat the solder on the right hand pot and that caused the insulation under the stress of being bent to pull away a little bit. It's not going to hurt anything, it's just not quite what I like. So if I'd have kept that wire going straight to the left, no stress on the insulation, it might have softened up the insulation but it would have hardened back up again and still look fine. Just a little point. Okay, now I added two more conductors in of the type that are hard to manipulate if you're too crowded. That's the purple on the left and the blue on the right. I went from the bottom connection, the bottom solder lug on each of those two selector switches to the center lug on the potentiometers. That's all I did here was added those two wires. And it's a good idea to do the wiring in this order. Now from here on out, uh, it's six of one half dozen of the other. So now I've added two red conductors to the middle and bottom of lugs of the on off power toggle switch. Now remember how these toggle switches work. When you flip 
the toggle up, it connects the middle lug to the bottom lug. Not in the direction you flip the switch. So right now, you know, if you could see the other side of this uh, cover, you would see that the toggle is flipped up in the direction of the lug with no connection. So we want you to flip the switch up to turn it on. So we have two red wires here. One's going to come from the bulkhead connectors and the other is the switched 24 volt DC to everything in the panel, everything in the enclosure. Okay, so there's your two red wires going from that on-off switch. Notice that I've laid the bottom half of the enclosure right next to it. Because as you're assembling this, you want to make sure that everything you're doing will reach from the top half to the bottom half, wherever it has to go. Otherwise, you're going to be wrestling with this thing as you get more conductors installed. And if you take it apart to do something, uh, you're not going to have any trouble pulling out the lid and laying it right next to it. So you can see that the uh, red wire from the potentiometers, if you look closely, it's just going over into that box and laying loose as the two from the on-off switch. So at this point, we don't have much of the power hooked up. Okay, now I'm taking three wires right here. One from the power from this display, power from this display, and the plus side of the indicator, the LED, and I'm twisting them together and soldering them. Um, I'll show you another option that looks neater than what I'm doing. But what I'm doing, I know won't fail. I know that it's not going to come disconnected because I'm soldering it really well and then putting insulation over it. So yes, it's starting to get real messy. Also notice that I brought the display voltage value, follow this red wire from the upper connector, it comes down to the positive terminal, the red terminal on that binding post. Then I've also got a green conductor that's going to leave this device and go out to the PLC. Then over here, I've got the yellow conductor, which is the, the voltage that you want measured by this display. And by the way, the voltage comes in from this green wire and goes into the display. Or it can go out through this binding post, binding post to your devices. Same thing over here with the gray wire. So the green and the gray wire are the connection between your analog outputs and these two displays. I attached the purple, brown, yellow, orange, white, and blue wires that are going to go to your analog inputs. I'm showing just one of them close up. The purple, uh, you can see the brown is going to the upper terminal here, yellow here, orange to the upper, the white to here. You have to look close. White goes to this terminal and orange goes to the bottom one. And then here's the blue. So remember the blue and the purple have the identical circuits. A little bit better view of the brown, yellow, white, orange, and the blue. So you see it's really getting messy now. Bigger box, some terminal strips, more money, more work. You could make it neater, but if you solder this up correctly, you only got to do it once. Okay, now I want to take and connect the center terminals on both bulkhead connectors to the center solder lug and the on off switch and notice that I twisted the wires together then took a piece of shrink tubing slid over it with ample excess length off in the direction of the bare wires and then I shrunk it down and that kind of gives me like a top hat connector um, that you crimp on here I'm taking a whole bunch of red connectors that are the 24 volt DC input to devices. If you look at this one right here, see this one goes over here, that's 24 volts in for this circuit card. And then you've got uh, 24 volts for this light. You've got 24 volts for each of these two displays. All these things require 24 volts DC to operate. The two displays, the pilot light, and the circuit board. So they're all jumper together along with the bottom wire on that switch. And then I'm gonna slip, I'm gonna solder it really good, and then I'm gonna, going to slip shrink tubing over it and shrink it down. I'm also gonna do the same thing with the red wire that goes to, to the potentiometer. So if you look here at the potentiometer over here, see the red wire goes over here to a splice that gets connected into here. So the 10 volts out from this bucking circuit 
comes through here and over to the two potentiometers. Notice also that I've connected a black wire from here to all of the black wires in here. You got one, two, three, four black wires in this bottom half of the box. You got a black wire here, black wire here, one from each of the bulkhead connectors. Then you got two commons from this circuit board, plus you got a common from over here. Those are all twisted together and then shrink tube. Then there's a black wire that's going to come out of this terminal. Remember I said not to solder this until you had all the wires in it. This joins these wires going to your I.O. module and that's the common to your I.O. module. A another view of the wires twisted together in shrink tube. Uh, what you do leaving that hole with your bundle of wires going to your I.O. module is kind of up to you. I usually supply a strain relief but it's not real tight. In other words, it, it fits in that hole, but the wires, because see, I don't know what you're using for a wire, how thick your insulation is. So that's something you got to be conscious of. I'll probably put one in the kits, and if it's too loose, then you can slide shrink tubing down to this point where it goes through the opening and shrink it down and see if that makes it tight enough and not. If not, add another layer of shrink tubing until it fits really tight in that strain relief. So this is a picture of the whole thing complete. Now I, I know it's messy. Um, and there are some other things you could have done to make it neater. First of all, there's plenty of empty space on the bottom of that enclosure for you to put in a terminal strip, like a 12 position uh, screw terminal. And then you could have run conductors from the top half over there and kind of marshal them into a much neater looking arrangement. So in other words, you would have a red wire coming from the potentiometers over to a terminal, and then you would have a red wire from your bucking circuit going to the same terminal instead of having it spliced together then shrink tubed. Again, just another view. You get to this point and it's getting crowded on you. Because with all these red wires, it's kind of hard to follow where they go. So if you've waited to this point to get organized, you made a mistake. You got to do this and organized because the the wires fill up your view really quick. Okay, again, final look of the assembled device. Now here is the option, the other, one of the options for twisting a bunch of wires together and soldering them and then putting shrink tubing on them. These are lever uh, circuit connectors or wire connectors. Two, three, four, and five position. Now these aren't terminals. So if you look at the two, the first one that has two holes in it, two orange levers, any wires that you put in either one of those two holes are shorted together. So this is like a splice. You could put two wires in there. Each lever hold downs one wire into the shorting circuit or you can go up to five. Now almost everything I showed you because it's 22 gauge, if you solder it, you know, tin it, you could slide four, five, six wires into that two position uh, lever connector there. You don't have to have three for three wires, four for four wires, or five for five wires. These things are dirt cheap. And this little bracket here and screw, I do have a bunch of these by the way, I just don't use them because uh, I think these, if they're gonna fail, which I doubt it, they're go not gonna, they're gonna fail quicker than a solder junction wheel if there's no motion stress on it. But these little orange brackets allow you to snap these down and you know, you can screw this down to a surface and snap it in so it's even neater yet. Okay, the, the device that, you know, I'm providing a kit for, it does not give you any signal for the two center sets of binding posts. And remember that those two center sets of binding posts each have a selector switch right above it that's labeled 0 to 10 or 4 to 20. So that allows you to wire up both to your analog module and then switch which you're feeding in. So there's nothing applied at those binding posts unless you apply it. Here are two inexpensive, we'll call them signal generators that will give you 4 to 20 or 0 to 10. 
actually might get 0 to 20, 4 to 20, 0 to 10. So he says 0 to 22 milliamps. Well, if you can't adjust it to get 4, uh, you're missing something. <laughs> so these are very inexpensive, around 20, 25 dollars. I have both of these. I've tried them out. They work real good. However, my favorite is this one. And this one comes from Tim Wilburn Controls. Uh, he's another individual on YouTube that is providing absolutely excellent information and instructions for anything to do with PLCs. He sells these on his website. I own one of these. This is exactly what I use anytime I'm going to do anything with analog signals. Now with this uh, simulator back here, it has 0 to 10 volts, two of them, in and out. So typically I don't go beyond that, but if I do need 4 to 20, this is what I use. I've tried both of these. They work good. You're not going to be unhappy with them. But I like the way this one works the best. Okay, there we have it. Um, as I said, uh, you may already have one of these that you purchased some time back, assembled or as a kit. Not very complicated. And I encourage you to build your own if you don't want to buy the kit. And if you do buy the kit, you don't, and you're not a good solderer, <laughs> don't practice on the kit because you're going to be wanting more parts. And I don't typically have more parts laying around, and it just isn't going to be very convenient for you if you practice soldering on the kits and then need more parts. Some of the things, like the toggle switches, if you apply too much heat to the solder lugs, it will soften the plastic casing. Remember, there's a spring in there. That's what you get the snap for the toggle. And that spring tension is pushing out. And if you soften the case of the switch, then it, everything gets displaced and it'll never work right. Again, I encourage you to uh, go your own way. You know, you're welcome to use anything I've got, copy anything I've got. Uh, they're very simple circuits. And in watching the videos, you'll see the circuit free, and you can build your own. Thank you.